Hello, this is about the Robert Minter hand list. I'll call it a database because that's what it is, of early trumpet music. I'm Trevor Herbert and I'm Professor of Music at the Open University. And later in this presentation, the trumpeter John Wallace is also going to take part. The first thing to say is something about Robert Minter. Robert Minter was an amateur trumpet player. He had a passionate interest in trumpets. He was very, very interested in the history of trumpets. And he collected music from before about 1800. His other passion in life was flying an aeroplane. He, was, he had a pilot's license and he got what was for him the ideal job. He worked for a firm which required him to fly around Europe in a small aeroplane delivering parts for other aeroplanes. Um, so he would go to tiny airports, presumably where repairs were taking place in various parts of Europe. And this allowed him to take time off and go to various archives where he could do some research into trumpet music. So he went to the most remote places in Czechoslovakia, Poland, Germany, Italy, all over, sometimes libraries, very often private archives, even into monasteries, looking for uh, examples of trumpet music. And before he left, he came away with some sort of facsimile of the music that he'd found, a photograph, a photocopy, or more often, a microfilm. Unfortunately, in 1981, when he was flying through Scotland in a snowstorm, uh, his plane got into difficulties, he crashed into a mountain and he was killed. He was 32 years old. I never knew him, but I'd been into his, in his company once. He was the most delightful chap and lots of professional trumpet players valued his, uh, his opinions about things. A few years later, the parents got in touch with me told me the story of his death, said that there was a collection of trumpet music and asked whether I could do anything to use this um, music that he'd collected for the common good. So I went to visit them and they showed me 17 enormous boxes full of over a thousand pieces of music. So I put it all in my car, drove back to the Open University, put it in my office, which completely, it completely filled the floor of the office. There was, I had to jump over the stuff to get to my desk. And then I wondered what I could do with this music that would be a suitable memorial to, to Robert's uh, work. There was a major problem, and it was this, that Robert had legally bought the the copies that he was using but they were bought for his personal use only and when he died they came to me and then i legally could own them or the university could legally own them but we had no right legally to disperse copies of this music so i had to find a way of using the music uh, without actually showing the copies to everyone um, in, in a public sort of way it therefore occurred to me that it might be a good idea if I was to collect information about the pieces and form a catalogue. Now the trouble with catalogues is that they take an absolutely enormous amount of time to organise. So for example, of the 1,000 pieces, I would have had to put, collect all of the Italian pieces together, all the German pieces together, all the French pieces together. Alternatively, I would have had to get all the duets, all the trios, all the quartets together to make some sort of reasonable, coherent catalogue. And I really didn't have the energy to, uh, to do that, and I'm not sure how much use it would be. However, there was another possibility. There was a new feature coming into academic life, which was called personal computing. Uh, this was in the early days. This was about 1989, by the way. Um, there was at the Open University some research going on into the future uses of computers. And I had a meeting with some of the researchers and they said, well, what you need to do is to get a database, a word I'd never heard before, by the way. And also, um, there is something which is brewing up in the computer community, which is called the World Wide Web. 
uh, and it might be launched in the next couple of years. But if you get on with the database, that may be a way of sort of broadcasting information about the music. So I decided that I would make a database uh, and I bought a, a thing called DBase4, which was made by a company called Ashton, Ashton Tate. I, was, I suppose I was very amateur. I mean, these days, everybody uses database, but it was completely new at the time. And it's quite interesting that when I was preparing this presentation, I was really just intending to, it to be um, a, an exemplification of the Minter database, and that's what it's going to be. But it's also quite interesting about the way in which people like me used computers 30 years ago. Anyway, I set out to, to create a database, and these are the decisions I took, and this is the way that the, um, that the database looked. Uh, a database is made up basically of, um, of two parameters. One are called um, records, and a complete horizontal span is one record. So, for example, this piece, the first one in the list by Henry Purcell, everything in the horizontal part of the chart is to do with that one piece. The other part are, are called fields or categories of information. So the categories I chose to, to use were um, composer, date, title, instrument, source, and so on. So uh, I should say that when you get to use the database, um, the, there are all sorts of uh, information that are preceded. For example, um, here there's uh, information about how the fields are used and how the analyst is organized. But I'll just say something about the way in which the, um, uh, the database is actually organized. Uh, the first field was the catalog number. This is a unique number to every piece in the, uh, in, in, in the collection. The next was the composer. Now, I didn't know the name of all of the composers because, of course, because Minter's death was so sudden, um, he had just left the stuff the way that it was when he, was, uh, he, he last worked on it. The next category was the date. Now, I knew some of the dates because the dates were on the piece. For example, this piece by Godfrey Finger, we know it was written in uh, 1701 because it says that in the, in, in, in the manuscript. But most of the pieces, we could only date approximately. For example, L17C means late 17th century. E18C means early 18th century. So that's the best we could do. Uh, the next field was the um, was the title of the piece, uh, and the title is a piece which, of, of the piece is the one which is written on the um, manuscript itself. Then there's the instruments. Now, one of the things that that we had to do in those days was to try to minimize the number of characters we used in a database because it wasn't to do with the problems with the software, it was to do with the fact that the computers could only deal with a rather small amount of information at a time. So there's a set of abbreviations um, for every instrument. So TRP is trumpet. Um, I did actually use different languages for the abbreviations so that people would find it easier to use. So for example, TRP is trumpet. I didn't want to use TRB for trombone because th those are too close together and people could easily make mistakes, including me, by the way. So I used POS, POS, short for persona, the German word for trombone, for trombone. But all of that, the key to the abbreviations, is in the introduction. Now the next category is the, is the source. Now I said that we couldn't um, use the original manuscripts in photographic form, but it struck me as being absolutely essential that people would, could find these manuscripts for themselves. So I've given an exact identification for every piece unless uh, and there, there are one or two pieces where I couldn't do that, but in the overwhelming majority I could do that. And to do it, I used what is known as the Risen Sigler. 
Now, the Rizm Sigla is an internationally recognized um, set of abbreviations for every library and every archive in the world, thousands and thousands of them. There is a link in the introduction to make the, um, to make the connection. So the first uh, couple of letters in the Sigla always refers to the country in which the archive is kept. So for example, if I put in there F, um, which means France, then you get um, the Sigla, the code for every library or archive in France. If I was to put GB, it would do the same thing for every library in Great Britain, and it goes throughout the world. So there is a link for that in the introduction to the database. The next field is called genre. So whether it's a sonata, a quartet, a symphony, I've put that uh, there. And then the final category, this final field is called notes. The notes section is is, is, is particularly useful because it allows you to find material, items, which otherwise would be difficult or impossible even to obtain. A very good example is I put into this search term under notes the word keyed. Now keyed is a part of the phrase keyed trumpet. The keyed trumpet was an extremely rare instrument on, on very, very uh, few pieces of music. Um, written for it have survived. Uh, the Haydn and the Hummel trumpet concertos were written for the keyed trumpet. So if I put in keyed and then I press submit, and there you go. There are two pieces that Minter uh, had actually found for the keyed trumpet, and I didn't know anything about those before I found them in this um, database. The other thing I wanted to show you is an issue about the composers. Now, where we know the composer, Purcell, Clark, whoever, it's fairly easy to, uh, to find a piece by them by looking for them in the search engine. However, the most frequently encountered name in the, um, in the database is anonymous, because a lot of the pieces um, either are anonymous in the sense that no one knows who wrote them, or uh, neither I nor Minter have been able to identify who they are. So uh, if I could get up um, a page of anonymous composers, and you can see in the composer line, every single um, piece is written by someone who is anonymous. That piece there, I think maybe by Handel, or at least one of my research assistants probably thought it was by Handel. But the rest of them, we don't have an idea. So to help you to, or to help readers, to identify those pieces, you will see that there is a hypertext link here, which we've um, put in, and those uh, go to Inchipits. And Inchipit is a tiny fragment of melody that um, is important in the piece of music. It is one of the main themes. So if I click on one of these uh, intrepids, and there you see the phrase of music that uh, is relevant to that particular record. And we've got um, quite a number of these intrepids, more or less for not all, but almost all of the pieces that are anonymous. Obviously, this was a much later development because um, it was well into the age of the internet and to the use of hypertext links when uh, we put this in, and it's very helpful. So that is the, um, the database. It may look a bit old fashioned today, but um, it still does its work. Um, and many hundreds of people have used this uh, to great advantage, and I hope that you find it helpful as well. Um, even though the database is old-fashioned, it would be as nothing without the work that Minter had originally done in collecting these pieces. So, 
now we turn to John Wallace. John is one of the uh, the best trumpeters of his generation, formerly principal of the Philharmonia Orchestra and plays early instruments on uh, new instruments, or modern instruments rather. Um, I'm very grateful to him for taking part in this video. So John, could I just um, start by asking you to explain what early trumpet means and how trumpets, uh, early trumpets different from the modern ones? Well, in the case of the Minta database, early means really the beginning of the 1600s. That's when trumpet music started to be written down and that we know that trumpet players were literate and they really entered into art music. Monteverdi's Toccata from Orfeo, his opera of 1607, is the first instance of printed trumpet music and it has uh, this toccata for six trumpets that happens at the beginning of the opera and it's played three times. That's the earliest piece in the Minta collection. Before that, uh, trumpet players, we think, uh, used to play extempore, in improvised, or they learnt uh, from by rote. Uh, from memory, they all had, say, uh, a, a master. It was a master-apprentice uh, system, and uh, the, in the Minter collection, there's lots of sonatas for two trumpets where the master and his uh, apprentice trumpet player uh, would, would follow. So if the early trumpet was a natural trumpet, and uh, the, it, it plays the notes of the harmonic series. Here's got a little bit of water in it. And it wasn't until about 230 years later that uh, this trumpet, the valve trumpet, was invented around about 1830s, 1840s, and gradually replaced the, the natural trumpet. Now, in the same uh, register, you see it... joins in all of the gaps in the natural series because it's really it's, the valves give you seven combinations of tubing which are like the seven positions on the trombone and give you a chromatic scale up the the whole length of the instrument so it's the, that's the the modern instrument uh, really from about 1830 to the present day and the natural trumpet, of course, is, uh, is still played, but the, most of the, the pieces in the Minter collection are from between those dates, 1600 to 1830. And then, uh, the, to play the stuff on the natural trumpet, uh, people started to play it on the, on the piccolo trumpet. So if I can show you the piccolo trumpet, uh, now, this is a natural trumpet in C. It's, it's much longer than it looks. It's twice as long uh, as this instrument, but as you can see, it's all coiled up in a, a different way, and uh, that, that's because it's handy for traveling with. So, it's in C. <laughs> little dinky thing is a piccolo trumpet in C as well and this is a quarter of the length of that so that's 
glasses, pedal notes, it's a bit difficult to produce. <laughs> So this is the piccolo trumpet that was really used until fairly recent times when people mastered the Baroque trumpet again to play uh, Baroque uh, music on. So it's a very, very different instrument altogether. Um, but it play, can play high. Yeah. And that's the opening bars of one of the pieces that you'll probably hear a little bit later on, the, the Fash Concerto in E major, it's a very difficult piece for trumpet, and oboe de mori and violin with orchestra. Yeah, John, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, I make this claim in the, um, in the database that it's got about a thousand uh, pieces. Um, uh, on the implication from Minter's research, and indeed from what I think is what I believe, is that there's still a lot of music which only exists in the original form and it has never been published. Is this true? Well, it's incredibly useful to have all of the information contained in the database because hardly any of the music is in modern publications and without a minted database he would have no idea of the extent and coverage over the whole of, of Europe of uh, writing for trumpet and how complicated it was, just how much of it uh, th there is. And it also makes very uh, apparent uh, after you steep yourself into it where the hot spots were and really what, where there were composers competing with one another like Fuchs and Caldara in, in Vienna and then all of the, uh, you know, the, well, we'll call them lesser composers, very good composers, working together with them uh, at, at the time. And so uh, I personally became uh, aware of a huge splurge around about the 1660s, late 1660s, 1670s in uh, Kromaritz and Salzburg and Vienna and so on during the time of the enlightened uh, Holy Roman Empire <laughs> Emperor Leopold I, who was also a composer and wrote lots of trumpet music. It's actually in the Minter uh, co collection. But he was a, a great, a great patron. And uh, so, you know, you, I wouldn't have ever become aware of the works of Vevenovsky, who was a trumpet player himself. Bieber was a fiddle player. And he went off to Salzburg uh, a little bit uh, later, taking the style of trumpet uh, writing uh, uh, with him. But Vevenovsky uh, was writing in odd keys and lots of non-harmonic passing notes and, and stuff like that. Very, very inventive and melodically for the trumpet then. And uh, from that sort of Austro-Bohemian stuff, there was uh, people who went across to England like Gottfried Fing Finger, who became Godfrey Finger over there. <laughs> and so there was a, the, and he took the, the style I, I got from the Minter collection to England so that John Blow started writing for trumpet St. Purcell and then the whole English style of writing for trumpet grew from uh, that seed. And uh, of course the Italians have always been <laughs> incredibly important in music. And so uh, on the other side of the Alps, of course, uh, the modern orchestra was being uh, developed late 1680s, early 1690s in the San Petronio uh, Basilica in Bologna. And so Torelli uh, worked there and uh, was about 30 pieces by him in, in, the, in the collection with other, other people around the same time, Stradella, Scarlatti and, and down, in, down in Naples. It's a huge amount of, uh, uh, amount, of, uh, amount of music. And then all of the English stuff that really got going in the early 1700s, you know, when there was the, the union and the start of the looking out for 
empire and stuff of, of Britain. And, uh, uh, and so the, there's a, an amazing amount of trumpet music uh, uh, from then. And then the, 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 the period, which is perhaps the most exciting, is just after the, the Baroque, early classical, when you would have thought that the style of music had left the, uh, the Baroque trumpet behind because it's only in one key and it can only go to closely related keys like uh, the subdominant or the, or, the, or the dominant. But composers uh, found a way of using it in the extremely high register. Uh, people like uh, Franz Aber Richter and Endler and, 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 so, and so on and Fasch. Uh, uh, who, who composed these these pieces that are, you know, well nigh impossible uh, to play uh, live in, in in concerts? Michael Haydn, Leopold Mo Mo Mozart, and uh, and so on. And there's a big big stash of those in the Minter collection. And then round about the uh, early 1800s, the when the key trumpet uh, was invented, there's a little stash of um, of exotic pieces by Kotzulu and Weigel and so on that you use uh, use odd instruments together like mandolin double bass grand piano and keyed trumpet or or uh, or glasses glass har gla there's another one but glass harmonica off stage keyed trumpet uh, obo d'amore, offstage obo d'amore and, and so on as well and uh, so you have th these people just finding it's a new century, it's a, it's a new age, uh, Napoleon is going to free us all and then of course Napoleon goes the way of all flesh and, uh, and becomes a, a tyrant like everyone else. Uh, so uh, there, so the, the whole uh, the the, 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 this, I would say it's indispensable, uh, you, it's in, indispensable to get knowledge of the, of the trumpet. You can't get knowledge of the trumpet from what's published out there. There just isn't enough. You know, people still say, oh, the trumpet doesn't have any repertory. So I send them the link to the Minter collection and say, my goodness. I never knew. So, uh, but again, again, it's hard to publicise something like the like the the Minter uh, uh, Minter collection. I've been publicising it my, myself, but I'm so uh, passionate about it. I suppose people have just stopped listening. <laughs> Can you give us some examples, John, of music uh, from the database that you've uh, performed or even recorded, perhaps? Yes, I've. Uh, I, I've uh, re recorded uh, quite a lot of, uh, about five or six CDs, uh, two volumes of um, Italian uh, Baroque m music for up to eight trumpets and, uh, and, and, and orchestra. And then uh, some of the fantastic arias for soprano and trumpet, um, which are, he Minter just plucked them out of quite long operas. He would have never have found them if he hadn't sort of plucked them all out. So there must be about 50 or 60 arias for one or two trumpets in the collection. So I, I made a CD, uh, Helen Field, of those. And then uh, there's all of these difficult trumpet concertos from the early classical period. that's still talking about earlier and I. I made one of these when I was, as you can see, I'm much younger on that, on that, on, on that, on, on that picture. And then there was, oh, my favourite one maybe is Rule Britannia because we did one of uh, English Baroque trumpet music from about 1700 to 1740, and it actually even has in it. Uh, he's he's got this uh, island princess, the music that. Jeremiah Clark wrote uh, for a play and in it it has this tune so that's uh, 
what the trumpet voluntary that you hear at a lot of weddings came from. Of course, it was discovered before the Minter collection because uh, uh, it, it was in the Pendlebury Library uh, in, uh, in Cambridge, and that was where Robert uh, Minter was mentored by Charles Cudworth, who was the uh, librarian. Uh, of Cambridge University and so and uh, but that was one of the early 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 English things and I started just to follow threads in the Minter collection and found this piece by Corbett in E major which is an outlandish key for the na natural trumpet and all sorts of pieces with mutes in them and all sorts of uh, uh, of stuff and uh, so and the <laughs> the English the English style is so different from the Italian style, different from the the French trumpet music has a flair. You would think everybody would just write an ordinary way, but even Handel started to write. He's a German composer, really born in Germany, but he got uh, he 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 went and learnt in uh, in Italy. And then he came to England and he started to write music in French style, but it soon became synthesized into, uh, we always, we all think of Handel when you hear, you know, uh, something like, um, we just all think of him as a quintessential English composer because it just sounds so English. You couldn't imagine Bach uh, as a German writing that. And so the the amazing thing about the 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 the, the, the Minter collection is that you know if you immerse yourself in it, it's it's just like uh, it's the right environment to actually focus and crystallize. Uh, uh, your, your, your ideas about the sequences of, of history and how localized music really was between 1600 and 1830, before the advent of the railways, I suppose, everywhere had the li different little styles and you would have a bohemian composer nipping out of Bohemia, Gottfried Finger, come to work, yeah, the streets of London were supposed to be paved with gold to make money, even handle, hand, handle came. And the old Brett brought germs of styles and turned it into another uh, local, local style. And if you can do that with 12 notes on the trumpet, you know, you can do it with practically anything. And the, the differences in style uh, are, are, are quite, quite, quite amazing. So I suppose in the end I did you know, about five or six CDs uh, uh, based on the Minter, uh, Minter collection. But it is quite... <laughs> I went up to Eno North, to up to Leeds, to see Helen Field in between, you know, rehearsals and shows and stuff like that. It's quite hard to get a hold of singers and I can't really talk about but So I went up and I saw her. And we got the whole CD sorted out. And I took a, I took a huge piles of stuff that I photocopied, you know, based on the Minter collection pieces by Predieri and so on that hadn't seen the light of day since 1740. And I took them in, and we, ah, oh, yes, we'll do this, we'll do that. All oh, we've got to do uh, as well. Yautzet got of Bach. That's you know, that's published, you know, but we've got to do that. So we make mix it up. A little bit, and I'll never forget on in the taxi on the way to station, the record company phoned up and said, "Oh, it's not very commercially viable to do this trumpet soprano thing. We want you to do Sousa marches instead." And I almost threw my phone out of the car window. You know, I just thought, "Oh my god!" But we did end up doing the trumpet uh, soprano stuff the following year. So, but I digress. <laughs> I've just been explaining that the database includes a piece, lots of pieces, where we can't identify the composers, anonymous pieces. Are these particularly interesting to you, or perhaps do you think they're particularly important? 
Well, there's a lot of great melodic material amongst the anonymous, anonymous pieces, and I think that we'll eventually find out who these pieces were by, because uh, I think the fact that they are not attributed to anybody is just a matter of the speed at which they were wrote or they were written locally uh, by well-known local composers who just forgot to put their names on it. There weren't such uh, big issues about composers' egos in those, those days. They didn't have any egos. They were just writing to order, writing for uh, special occasions. But in the places where they were, there were special occasions and feast days and things, almost every other day. I mean, Bach was writing uh, cantata every, every, uh, every week. And so... Uh, uh, and the copyists as well would just say, "Oh, we'll copy something out," and forget to write down the name of the of the composer, because everybody would know who the composer was, and they weren't writing for posterity. I mean, posterity just didn't exist by then. We did, you know. And uh, so, unfortunately, I think it's just you know the fact that the music wasn't going to be published. Uh, uh, wasn't local. The composers probably had very small egos, you know, they, they, and they were just writing to order for the same uh, musicians all of the time that they're, they're just not attributed to any anyone at the moment. But I, I'm quite intrigued. It's the most tantalizing part of the thing. There's lots of outdoor music in in this uh, uh, written for oboe bands and oboe bands when they wanted to be heard they employed the trumpet as well to push to bolster up the the top line and um, so uh, so so it's very very tuneful uh, some of the most tuneful music is in the uh, uh, is in the uh, anonymous bit and there are some tantalizing pieces from later on from collections that I would just love to be able to attribute to 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 Mozart because then you know then people would start looking at the at the at the the Minter collection and thinking my goodness maybe there's Beethoven's trumpet concerto in here but we do know that Mozart wrote a trumpet concerto very early on and there's a, there's a couple of candidates uh, for this, and I, I just feel that now I would like to delve even deeper again. Now I've got a bit more time into the Minter collection and tease out these anonymous pieces and de-anonymize them, because we know where they came from, we know roughly the period, we know the composers that were, were, were working there, and I'm sure with a little bit of um, detective work, you know, we just need Inspector Megre. Uh, we'll be able to, to find out who these anonymous pieces are by. And finally, John, I, I don't take credit for this. I think the credit goes to Minter, but how valuable do you think it is? How helpful um, is it to performing musicians? Well, I think the, I think the database is invaluable and I think it's incredibly useful and I, I left trumpet playing really about 20 years ago to go into an administrative job and uh, it was at that time that I left off you know exploring it and now I've gone back to it 20 years later I think my good there's so many threads that I'd like to pick up on and the problem with um, many young players is that they're playing the same old rubbish as everybody else you know so why not find some new stuff or, or of your or of your own and there's enough usbs in here for 20 30 young players there's also enough i mean i uh with my friend sandy mcgratton wrote uh, a book for yale on the history of the trumpet and yeah, most of it, most of my 
sequence of t from the early 1600s. Of course, things happened to the trumpet before 1600, the very early trumpet, but between 1600 and 1830, there's no better uh, encapsulation of the works of the trumpet than the Minter collection. So for the book, you know, that was, <laughs> I suppose, the outpouring of my life's work into it with Sandy, uh, the Yale history of the, the trumpet, this was invaluable. But I do think there's at least another six books in it and at least another 60 CDs. Uh, there's so much of interest here in focusing in the diff different periods of, uh, of what w went on in the idiosyncrasies of each piece. Now, the natural trumpet isn't a complicated instrument. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> like you would think that all the tunes would end up sounding the same, but they don't. In the hands of different nationalities, in the English, French, German, Italians, you can just see the fingerprint of the different national styles all in this Minter book. So for those reasons, it's absolutely invaluable. And I think it needs further dissemination to all of the music colleges and conservatories out there, just so that, you know, that students are made aware of it whilst they have the, this fabulous time at university and conservatories, three or four years that they have to, to try to make their own um, musical fingerprint out of this sort of vast resource uh, that's, that is the Minter Collection. John, thanks very much. That really was helpful. So I hope you found this interesting and um, and that you will use the database. Um, I continue to think it's, it's very helpful. Above all, I think it's a great credit to Robert Minter, um, who a long time ago, getting on for 40 years now, he collected all of this music. And I'm delighted that um, information about it is freely available at the Open University for everyone to use. Thank you.